The program we are about to present is concerned with towers as this one. The height and size of the tower is dependent upon what is being done inside the tower. In the service of this tower, a large number of trays are required. Therefore, a tower of great height is required. This tower is much shorter and requires less trays. Also, the process material is likely of a different nature. This also affects the height and size of the tower. Towers as this one are large in diameter. The diameter or width of a tower depends on the amount of material that the tower must handle. Tower height depends on the difficulty of the separation. The more difficult separations require more trays. The less difficult separations will then require less trays. The total height of the tower, therefore, depends on the number of trays required and the space between the trays. A large amount of material demands a tower of large diameter. The smaller amounts of material going through the tower require a tower of small diameter. A tower to handle 40,000 barrels of crude per day would then be larger in diameter than a tower that has to handle only 8,000 barrels per day. Our main objective of this course is the tower internals. Most of the time, when we speak of tower internals, we have reference to trays. A tray, in common language, is a horizontal partition in the tower, spaced properly apart. Its purpose being to bring the liquid and vapor into close contact. The tray is not a part of the tower structure, but is supported in the tower. It can be torn loose and upset in the tower during an operational malfunction. This is the shelf ring, or tray support ring. These rings are welded to the tower shell in their proper location. Extreme care should be used during their installation. They generally are kept level and aligned, as there is a close tolerance as to how much it can be misaligned. The ring should be flat within one thirty-second of an inch for any twelve-inch cord. This is a tray deck laid out in preparation to installing it in a tower. Notice the rounded sections, where it fits on the shelf ring in the tower. Also notice the width of the pieces. All pieces of the tray deck or floor must pass through the manholes of the tower. To bolt or fasten the flat tray sections to the shelf or support rings of a tower, a bolting device of this nature is used. The tray section has holes punched in its edge to receive the bolts. The flat section of the device fits under the support ring. Generally, these are called tray clamps and come in many sizes and shapes. To support the tray in larger towers, support members or beams may be necessary. In tower installation of support beams, these are called major beams. The definition of a major beam is one that is ten feet or longer, or any beam which extends across the tower without interruption, regardless of length. A general rule is any beam where both ends attached to the tower shell is called a major beam. In addition to the major beams, some trays require the use of minor beams. They normally support the tray at right angles to the major beams. A general rule to identify minor beams is beams which have one or both ends fastened to a major beam. They are also not as large as the major beams. There are many different types of openings in the tray sections that are found in towers. Although most are installed alike, the openings are different. This shows a jet tab tray. The tabs stand out on the top side. A drawing of this tray is in your workbook. This drawing shows the details of one type of jet tab tray. They come pre-punched, but caution should be used in handling. The height of the tab is very critical, and care should be used so the tabs will not be opened or closed. Another type of tray is called a sieve tray. It is usually a flat tray section with the proper size holes punched or drilled through the tray. Generally, the holes for this tray are small as one half inch in diameter. It is bolted down as most other types. 
The use of another type tray is now being used a lot. It is called a ballast tray. It works like a valve. The openings in the tray are fitted with a unit that controls the liquid and or the vapor flow. The bubble cap tray is a common type of tray. It is installed similar to other types, except for the caps themselves. Bubble cap trays have openings like this. All bubble cap trays are not made the same way. Sometimes the accessories that fit the tray are installed differently. But all bubble cap trays have large openings like this, although this is a model piece to show the openings. This accessory for a bubble cap tray is called the riser, or more commonly, the chimney. Its purpose is to support the cap and allow the vapor to come up through the tray from the tray below. Although there are many sizes and many variances, the chimney is important to the operation of the tower. The height of the chimney is critical. Different types of caps may fit the chimney, but the height is what sets the bubble cap at its proper operating height. This is a standard round bubble cap. The cap is mounted on the top of the chimney. The lower edge of the bubble cap has teeth or slots cut into them. There may be different sizes and shapes of these slots. The vapor is forced out through these slots at the lower edge of the cap into the liquid on the tray deck. The cap sits on top of the chimney on these support lugs. Most round caps have three support lugs that are spaced 120 degrees apart. There is just enough clearance to allow the cap to fit onto the chimney. The lugs are about one-eighth inch larger in diameter than the outside diameter of the chimney. The bubble cap is shown in its proper position and is installed over the chimney or riser. The chimney keeps the cap at the proper height and over the holes in the tray floor. This shows the basic three parts of the bubble cap assembly. The cap is being pointed to, and on the other end is the bolting device that holds the assembly in place over the holes in the tray. To keep the cap in place, it is bolted to the tray with a bolting device, such as this one. It fits under the tray, and the bolt comes up so the chimney and cap fit over it. It is made so it will not pull through the hole in the tray. The long bolt section comes up through the cap with a nut on top of the cap. Most all the types of trays have some things in common. To keep a liquid level on the tray, a dam or weir is installed. Some trays have two weirs, but most require at least one weir. Their purpose is to control the amount of liquid on the tray deck. This weir, next to the downcomer, or in the area where the liquid comes down from the tray above, is called the inlet weir. This weir is not always found on every type of tray. It is generally referred to as the distributor weir. This weir is generally called the overflow weir, or outlet weir. Without an overflow weir, no liquid would stay on the tray. The installation of weirs is important from the maintained height standpoint. It should be level and kept at its proper height. Another common feature of all trays is the downcomers. The downcomer is a passageway through which the liquid flows down from one tray to the next lower one. Notice the downcomers are on the opposite sides of the tower at each tray. This allows the liquid brought down to flow over the tray before it goes on down to the next tray. As mentioned before, the weir next to the downcomer controls the level of this flow. Most oil industry towers are tray towers. However, packing instead of trays is also used to provide the contact between vapor and liquid. There are many variances in the use of packed tower. This is a common type of packing in a tower. It is a hollow cylinder with a diameter equal to its height. The packing material in towers may be ceramic, non-corrosive metal alloy, or other materials that will not be corroded by impurities in the feed. 
The towers can be packed by two methods. The method shown here is random packing. The tower, or sections of the tower, are packed or filled with the material the way a bucket is filled with ice cubes. Other towers are packed in layers. Towers, and even sections of towers, may be packed with materials such as sheets of mesh, placed in layers in the tower. The packed method is also used in addition to trays. You will find some towers could have both types in it. When towers are packed in layers, a support base is required. This concludes the segment on nomenclature and terminology of tower internals. We have some review questions for you in exercise number one in your workbook. During this segment, we will show you the methods and procedures that are used to install a tray in a tower. The tower used for this purpose is a model for training and is not an actual tower. The floor has no openings like an actual tray would have, but the installing steps will be shown. All of the parts that make up a complete tray must come through a manhole in the tower such as this one. The shelf ring that supports the tray floor is just above the manhole. The tray floor, or deck, is to be placed on these rings and bars. This is what holds the tray parts in the proper position. The tray floor is normally bolted to these rings and bars. These are the shelf ring and the downcomer bars, and they are welded to the tower shell. Most trays are designed to be installed from the top side. As with all jobs in our plants, you need the proper tools for the task. Although many other tools can and are used, these are the basic ones we will use to install this tray. Be sure you have your personal protective equipment and the proper work permit before starting your job. One of the most important things to remember on this task is to properly place each tray section and accessories in their designated place. This is accomplished by referring to the drawing or sketch of the tower tray you are working on. One good way to do this is to lay out each piece of the tray in its respective position outside the tower. Follow the drawing and lay each piece in its proper position. When the sections are then sent inside the tower, the proper installation sequence is easily followed. You should also separate and pick out the bolting accessories for the tray installation. The drawing will have an assembly parts diagram that shows each part and its mark number. By checking the installation diagram, you can find where each of the accessories fit in relation to the tray. We are now ready to begin the tray installation. In this instance, we will install the first piece in the tower. This piece should be selected from the parts and installed in the tower first. Remember, your drawing of the assembly will list the parts and you should follow the drawing. The piece of tray being bolted into place first is the downcomer truss. It sets the correct position for all of the other tray sections. The spacing and measurements are taken from this piece. You should follow the markings on the pieces and the drawing to be sure the correct piece is used. Follow the assembly diagram to be sure the proper assembly parts are used for each piece. The bottom part of the downcomer truss is installed and properly bolted into position. Notice the top of the installation is above the top of the shelf ring. This is the built-in weir of the tray. The other downcomer pieces can now be installed if the position of the tray is so located. Bolt the downcomer piece in place as required, being sure to follow the assembly diagram and use the proper accessories. Check the drawing often enough to select the proper assemblies. The slotted holes in this downcomer piece gives you enough space to adjust the downcomer so the proper height can be held according to the specifications and the drawings. Install the last downcomer piece in the proper sequence. Tighten each accessory bolt as required. Check the total height to be sure you have it properly installed. The sections next to the tower are next to be installed. These must be carefully placed 
and kept square with the downcomer truss. Install all the bolting accessories that are required. Be sure the tray support ring clamps are properly positioned as you tighten them. Use a framing square is one good way to check the alignment of these sections. Remember, the tray floor is to be aligned and positioned using the downcomer truss as the reference or starting point. After both of the end sections are in place, install the last section that fits the curvature of the tower in place and bolt it securely. Again, align these sections as you install them. It is always wise to check the measurements as you install the tray floor. Measure the distance to be sure the next piece will properly fit. It will save you work if you don't have to go back and loosen the bolts to properly space the tray floor sections. It is just good practice to align and properly place each section in its relative proper position. Place in position the next section of tray deck and its bolting accessories. Refer to your assembly diagram to be sure you have the correct piece in the proper sequence. This section, as the last section, are the same. Be careful in your alignment so the rest of the floor will be properly spaced and will fit. The last two sections of the tray floor make up the removable part that is the manway. It is bolted and constructed so the pieces can be removed to allow entry of workmen to go from one tray to another when an outside manhole in the tower is not between each tray. Check the measurement so you are sure the manway plates will fit the tray floor. This bolting device for the manway section is so made so it can be loosened and the tray floor removed without complete removal of the bolting device. Also, it can be loosened from the top or the bottom of the tray. Notice the flat side of the stud. This is the proper way for installing the manway lock clamp in the tray floor. They should be left loose, so the manway lock clamp can be turned. The flat side of the stud, when facing towards the tray floor section, turns the locking clamp so the tray section can be installed. All the manway lock clamps should be installed and turned so the deck sections will fit into their proper positions. The flat side of the stud should face the tray section, and the wide part of the locking clamp should be facing away from the tray section to be installed, and the tray section is positioned under the locking clamps. We are now ready to install the manway tray floor sections. We need to make this important decision at this time. Remember the location of the exit manhole in the tower governs the installation of the manway floor sections. Since the tower manhole in this instance is under the tray, the manway floor sections will be installed and tightened from the bottom side of the tray. Install one section in position and check the opening for the other section. You can align the manway locking clamps on the first section at this time, but it is usually best to put in both sections before you do this. You may have to position the pieces to get both in the proper alignment. Install the other manway floor section in the proper position. You are now working from the bottom of the tray. Install the bolts to fasten the two pieces together. Be sure each manway locking clamp is in the proper position. The top side should show the manway docking clamps in this position. They are in the unlocked position. Turn each of the manway locking clamps to the locked position. Slightly cock the stud and turn it 90 degrees. This turns the top clamp over the tray sections to the proper locked position. Remember, this is done from the bottom of the tray floor. Tighten each of the nuts on the studs, being sure the docking clamp does not turn from the locked position. The flat side of the stud should be kept in the proper position. Put the nuts on the studs and tighten them. Be sure the stud does not turn while the nut is tightened. This shows how the lock clamps should look from the top of the tray. They are turned and tightened from the bottom of the tray. 
Now they cover both tray sections and hold both pieces together. If the exit manhole in the tower is above the tray, you must bring in both of the sections and bolt them together and install them as one piece. The manway locking clamps are then tightened from the top side of the tray floor. This is a view of the completed tray assembly from the top and completes our presentation on installing a tray floor in a tower. There are many variations to this procedure, but in general, most tray floors are installed in this manner. A bubble cap tray would look like this, with the caps showing on the top of the tray. In an actual bubble cap tray, the deck would have numerous openings like this. These are the openings over which the bubble cap is installed. Let's review how to assemble a bubble cap onto a tray piece. This is the bolting device that holds the assembly together and is fastened to the tray deck section. It is called a frog in many places. Now you see the chimney or riser pointed out. This holds the cap in position and holds it to the proper height. The bubble cap itself. There are many variances to this cap, but generally most are quite alike. The differences are in size and location of the teeth or slots. Let's begin our assembly by installing the bolting device in its proper position through the tray deck. Keep in mind that most trays of this type are designed to assemble all the parts from the top side. Pull the bolting into its proper position. Most bolting devices are made to stay in position while assembling. Place the chimney or riser over the bolting device on the tray section. It sets on the deck over the opening provided. Some chimneys could also fit into the opening and have a seat to hold them to the proper height. Place the cap over the chimney and position it with the bolt through the hole in the cap. The cap should sit down on the chimney snug and resting on the three supports that are built into the cap. Place the hold down nut on the bolt with washer if required. Tighten the assembly snug. Tighten just enough for the assembly to feel solid and there is no side movement when the cap is tapped lightly. That completes this segment on tower internals. We have some questions for you in exercise number two in your workbook.